Hello everyone, and welcome to this week's OctaTrack video. So um, the last couple weeks I've been talking about using Ableton and the OctaTrack together, and um, this week I want to focus on some things I've learned along the way that I think are really helpful for um, using these two tools um, in tandem with each other without getting too confused. Um, I think that's a really big, important thing to keep in mind. So hopefully some of these tips um, will aid you. So first of all, let's go to the project settings um, and go into system and personalize and just check out the uh, project setting save samples too because um, I've had this defaulted to audio pool which it defaults to uh, for a long ass time and um, turns out having it set to your project directory is extremely helpful because you no longer have one shared folder for every sample that you've ever saved, um, which I think clears out a lot of clutter in my um, project directory. So I would highly recommend setting that up. Um, it's something that I haven't really done, so you'll you'll notice in my own audio file, uh, audio folder, I just have like a ton of other just samples and stuff. and. Those th like these are some of my least used samples because I can't tell if I'm using them in a project already or they were used for one specific project and I didn't really need them for other things. So I would recommend uh, just specifying exactly where you put it and hopefully that'll improve or hopefully that'll encourage you to save more things um, to your projects. The next thing you may notice um, in this particular project is I don't have any... Um, machines set up that are meant to route any of these instruments. I don't have my OP1 or my um, OB6 or my um. base station coming through the OctaTrack at all. So I have it set up through MIDI, um, but the audio is going directly into Ableton. And so this is, um, this is my way of keeping things clear. If I'm going to work with Ableton as well, I think it helps to keep as many stems separate as possible. Um, I'm not really interested in separating out stems within the OctaTrack, um, but as far as multiple instruments are concerned, um, I basically have a different channel set up for every single instrument. Oh yeah, so you can see that. And then, um, and then the bass station over here. And um, what that lets me do is if I record something for, you know, two hours and then I want to go back to that one thing, then I can actually pick it out, um, at least if it's an instrument. And um, on top of that, I can still do the thing that I was showing you guys before, which is using a send to send your audio back in. So if I have my vocal set up as a send right here, then you'll notice that the uh, input is coming in right here. And then um, I can basically sample anything that I want. And it'll just show up. Sample anything that I want. Sample it. Um, and that's a really cool way to just like pick up really quick um, ideas. Um, so it's really just at your fingertips. All it takes, um, hardware-wise, is to have an audio interface that has more than one pair of stereo outs. So next up is a, um, a tip that I uh, just kind of figured out out of convenience. So um, I've carried over some things from my... Uh, my performance. So like the main thing that I do when I perform with the OctaTrack is, is a lot less involved than the things that I demonstrate on this channel. Um, oftentimes I'm playing stems in arrangement mode and I just go boom, boom, boom. I'm having like an entire set list of tracks playing um, back to back or I have certain points where they loop. But um, long story short, I have a few tracks set up that are playing um, entire full length um, stems of maybe the background vocals, the instrumentals, um, the beat, and the beat is separated out so that I can mute things as I see fit. But um, from that, I was working on some production stuff this week, and I was like feeling lazy, and I didn't really want to, you know, sample everything in Ableton the way that I had kind of been talking about the last couple of weeks. Um, so I was just like, why don't I just take um, these full-length samples and slice them? So um, so for example, um, I'll just demonstrate with a new project. So if I have um, a new file in my audio pool, and um, you can see my, my performance folder has just like a ton of different stems. Um, and I could pick out like this background vocal, right? So 
but I knew that there would be a lot of silence in it because it's it's playing alongside and it's not always playing. So there's going to be like silence here, and then you get to this point where you have. So I could just create slices as I go. And the thing is, slicing is not a super exact science. And like, if anybody listens to Jay Dela, which I'm sure like most people who have a sampler are aware of that person, um, then you probably know that some of the best samples come from inaccurate slicing and weirdly placed uh, rhythms, um, which I'm not super good at doing because I'm a bit OCD about. Yeah, so say I have these slices and I can even... So you can use that as a really easy way to harness some uh, new creative potential of like existing stems that you may have uploaded. Um, it doesn't have to be a perfectly um, sliced out thing. And uh, and I've used this to 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 varying degrees of success for my own like ideas, new beats, and I can kind of go through a few of these. So. Um, I basically set up this bank, um, and it's really messy. You'll notice it was just like I put it in bank nine because it was physically far away from this other set of banks that I was working with from the last few videos. So I straight up just like put one here, and I started playing with like these old instrumentals and like some some drum loops, and I used um, this drum chain as like a way to performatively add some elements. That I would really think. But if we play that. So these are all just different ideas that I came up with, mostly off of the same beat. Um, I've gotten a few questions about how best to um, change the sample that's being triggered within the same track. So like if in track three, for example, I have this Hootie's sample which is like a keyboard synth thing that I recorded once on. I think it's like a contact plugin. And, um, and I recorded that a while back, but you'll notice on part one or on pattern one, I have a very different sample. And uh, I accomplished that by using parts. Um, you can also hold down the trig and press down and up to select a different sample in your library or in your um, audio pool, but I would recommend not doing that um, personally because I lose track of what I'm actually using in a project if I do that too much because this this uh, text does not indicate what this track is if I switch it around. It'll just say what the default would be. And I try to keep my like P locks specific to like a performative kind of thing as opposed to, because for example, like, we have this rate thing. And it's nice to be able to affect multiple trigs with this, um, with this parameter. But you'll notice there are certain ones that are P-Lock. So I think it really just has to do with your approach to like P-Locking and what keeps you at, like, in the creative mindset and the creative flow as possible. Um, but personally, um, I would recommend if you have like a particular theme that you're trying to hit um, to use an entire bank just for that. Because like, for example, I set up my songs for performance um, based on banks because I don't want to have like four patterns here representing one song and then have to remember that like pattern five in this bank is the next song. It's much easier for me to say bank one, song one, bank two, song two. And I think creatively speaking, it also helps to set up 
um, each bank almost has its own like creative project and then have all of those projects um, basically share one audio pool. Um, Cause that's the limitation in the Octatrack is you, you get one audio pool of like 128 samples, which should be plenty. So once again, um, this week the main goal is to just reinforce some ideas that can keep your project uh, clean. Because there's a lot of ways to get confused and stuck. Um, and I've talked about this in the past, like how you can, cle uh, how you can sort of uh, keep a clear mind when you're working with um, something that has so many options in it. Um, as far as like, for example, saving parts, you know, like if I save this particular part, I want to make sure I keep saving it um, so that if I ever get to a point where I'm like, oh shit, I really didn't want that, then I can just reload the part and I'm back to square one. Um, this is especially helpful if you play with effects a lot and you have a default that you really want to go back to. Because like filtering, for example, like it's good to just have your filter open as part of a default in your parts so that you can just reload that every time. But then on top of that, I would recommend not doing what I did here, which is just having banks all over the place. Like just go one through whatever. Um, keep your files saved to your project specifically as opposed to the, to the audio pool. Um, keep your instruments distinct from the Octatrack um, if you can because that helps you uh, down the road. So it's really just like this week, I just kind of want to consolidate some of those elements I think another big thing that I've learned this past couple weeks that I do want to um, bring up as well is that like like last week I did this track where I had these these exported stems which were like each maybe four bars or two bars and I turned them into a um, sort of a dance remix um, but at the same time I think there's a lot of um, rigidness to that that idea because you're going into Ableton and you're picking out a very specific set of stems that you want to then um, do something to um, in the Octatrack. And I think that can be really limiting. So it's been helpful to me um, to just break from that a little bit and go back into some files that I don't actually have, like time synced or um, things that I don't expect to actually use, like these stems. Like normally I would just use them as, as they are, but to go into them and treat them as though they're a, a sample that you can slice up um, can be pretty liberating. So I would recommend trying that. Like take your whole file, like take an instrument specifically because the Octatrack does pretty bad warping in here, but take like a specific instrument um, that you jammed out with um, in Ableton and just like export that entire like three to four minute improvised session or or that just that stem and play with that instead of um taking like a two bar loop like don't limit yourself to what you think is the best because oftentimes you'll find that like weird stuff happens like for example i was working with this um this background vocal and um i did a cover of um miguel's sure thing like this this would never have happened if I had actually picked um, a two bar loop or something I don't think I would have picked this particular loop so it helps to just have a lot of material and to not think so rigidly about how that material should be used so um, that's pretty much everything I want to go over this week um, I have a lot of things that I've been working on um, that I want to get to but I wanted to take the time to just kind of um, wrap up some of my favorite lessons from working in this way um, before I move on to things like DJing, which I've been getting back into um, on the Octatrack, um, as well as uh, doing some MIDI stuff, which people have been requesting a lot. So I've been learning a bit about that, and uh, hopefully I will be prepared um, soon and can explain uh, a general overview of how MIDI can be used, not only just as like a triggering mechanism, because I mean, 
uh, frankly, I feel like that's a little bit um, boring. So if there's there's an ARP on here that you can play with, and we'll talk about that. So um, thanks for watching, and see you next week.